Yay. Wow. Wow, we have a lot of us. And I think Marissa and maybe Rob are joining us. And I know Ruth, Ruth texted me in like five minutes ago and said he was going to be five to ten minutes late because he and some folks down the Catawba Reservation were doing stuff by the river. And I guess he said people were like really lackadaisical. So he's running a little late. Well, I know. <laughs> Activities by a river. How dare he? We need to colonize him right now. <laughs> no, so there's not much you can say to that. Like, right? I kind of just made your face really big and you were just like going like this. Yeah. <laughs> I know, that's my, my problem with this thing. I'm always like. <laughs> I always forget that it jumps to you if you start moving. And so like if you start oh, really? a little dance by yourself, <laughs> suddenly the screen's like, you're really important. <laughs> I promise I'll contribute something of substance to this conversation besides my head bouncing. <laughs> you did so much already. Is this being recorded? <laughs> yeah, it's actually, we're being streamed live on HowlRound TV right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that we're on their Facebook page. Yeah, yeah, Martha's here. Um, and then also maybe on their Twitter and Possibly on their website. They said it was in three different locations. Hello. <laughs> I also just wanted to share with everyone on behalf of Rob, he is running between meetings, but he hopes to join us in my office. So you might see him just swoop by. Cool. So then I, maybe we should just get started. And so Rue and Rob will join us when they can. Yay. Okay, awesome. Yay. Um, so welcome. Um, I guess for Maddie, we should do some kind of like intro into for people who are joining us live streaming. Oh, yes, we should, shouldn't we? Yeah. Welcome uh, to the new model of uh, an essay. <laughs> um, yeah, do you want to just talk a little bit about like why we we're having this conversation as opposed to like words on a page? Like why we thought it was important to all gather and talk to each other like people. Yeah, I'll say a little bit, and then if you want to say anything that I missed, that would be awesome. Awesome. Um, so, so Jamie Gallen from HowlRound asked me and Maddie, basically, three months ago about doing this series on decolonizing theater, and one of the first things that we thought about was how the written word um, ha has essentially been weaponized as a tool of colonization. So we were like, we can't have all of these pieces just be written documents. Is there a way that we can actually have voice body conversations um, and be in a space with each other? Um, as much as digital spaces, you know, can do that. Um, I'm glad that Amrita and Rob are gonna be able to actually be in the same physical space with each other, so that's cool. Mm -hmm. um, Manny, do you wanna say any more about that? Yeah, I think, yeah, already it's already, it's interesting to me, like, the ways in which um, already there's a kind of automatic humanity gathered by just, like, even though it is digital, um, Annalisa, like, by having the conversation, like, the giggling bits that can exist, right, in the written form of the text, because everything is so 
highly cultivated within a very specific form of communication and very specifically within the English language that doesn't leave room for a lot of in-between space. Um, and so I think a big part of why we kept thinking about format is that, um, you know, we get, we get very good about fitting ourselves into the sort of uh, single author narrative in carefully scripted English that maybe isn't actually always the best way to even communicate what it is that we're trying to talk about. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um, great. So on that note, maybe we should all introduce ourselves and um, if we could just go around and introduce ourselves by our names and then say our pronouns and um, in the spirit of decolonizing rather than introducing ourselves by our institutions, can we say what is the watershed region where we are currently located? So we can try to honor the land where we're all individually physically located right now. So I'll start. My name is Annalisa Diaz. My pronouns are she and her. And I'm in Washington, D.C., which is part of the Anacostia watershed and also part of the, the Greater Chesapeake Bay watershed. Uh, hi, I'm Madeline Sayet. I am uh, currently uh, I'm currently in Mystic, which used to be Mystic, which is a traditional Pequot territory, but the watershed is now called the Thames. Uh, she, her, hers. Sorry, go ahead. Whoever wants to go next, uh, just step in for we're in this uh, digital medium, and uh, if you move and speak, it will it will like call itself to you. Hey, hi, I'm Mary Catherine Nagel. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, living currently right now within the borders of the Creek Reservation which uh, the state of Oklahoma has asked the United States Supreme Court to declare no longer exists, so stay tuned for that. And the watershed, um, I mean, the Arkansas River goes right by here, so I think it's the Arkansas River watershed. Hi, I'm Dawn Monique Williams, uh, she, her, hers, and I am rehearsing a play uh, in Portland, Oregon, so I am at the uh, Willamette watershed. Hey, I'm Larissa Pastores. I am a member of the Sikonji Lakota Nation, and um, I'm currently living on Quinket, Kumeyaay, Kuiya, Chumash, uh, Keech land in uh, Southern California, which is part of the, they, they call it just the, when I looked it up officially, they call it like the Southern California watershed or something, which is, couldn't be more inaccurate. Um, but anyway, there's, the Great Pacific is probably our biggest known water here, which is our connector to um, all the Pacific Island nations and the rest of the world. Hi, I'll go next. Uh, my name is Lisa. Um, I am currently in the Sahara by Pakistan, so I guess we're in the Indus River Basin. Um, and my pronouns are he, him, and his. Hi. Um, my name is Amrita Ramanan. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And uh, I also feel like there might be some inaccuracy in what I looked up and what I researched with Watershed, but I did some digging. And it, uh, I'm in Ashland, Oregon, and the two watersheds that were intersecting were the Chutes and the Klamath Watershed. I, I'm Megan sandberg Zakian. I also, uh, I also feel like there's more watershed than the internet told me, but the one, the one that it told me is the one I can see, which is the Charles River I'm in the middle of Boston, um, Mashpee, Wampanoag, Pawtucket folks, and many others, and she, her, hers. Tanaka, y'all. Uh, my name is Delessa George Warren, but you can call me Roo, just like Kangaroo. Um, I am from Catawba Indian Nation, the people of the river, um, which is also why I'm late, because we were doing uh, a, a biodiversity assessment on our river. 
Um, so that's my watershed is the Catawba River, um, where my community has lived since, we would say, since the world began. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I use Heaving. <laughs> and I'm an artist and sound designer. <laughs> mm. Cool. Um, I'm going to throw it back to Maddie to start the question. You just want to like say the question that we were going to ask, and we'll just have a conversation among the people that are here? You're muted. Uh, yeah, let me just pull up the exact the exact question wording so that I don't um, reframe it again. Uh, so, um, oh, and also, um, I realized I said where I am, which is in the traditional lands of the Pequot Nation, but I am I am Mohegan. Um, I have crossed the river. was um, how is thinking about the theater field as an ecology helpful in terms of decolonizing methodologies and practices and how is the metaphor as of theater as an ecology also uh, a pitfall for people thinking about decolonizing so just sort of what what that that terminology um, can do that is useful and then also uh, potentially problematic mm. And if anyone wants to jump in, um, just jump in. And if you if you don't, this is like a, just because the way these little boxes work, like if you just sort of like wiggle and make sound, like that is the only, it's the only real efficient <laughs> way to, to take turns. Mm -hmm. We all started wiggling. We got so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I always feel like it's funny because there's these like, these like moments of like pausing for respect, but you can't all make eye contact with each other. <laughs> it's just based on wiggling. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm happy to start if that's all right with everyone, uh, because this was a, am I coming through? Am I unmuted? Okay. <laughs> I got a new computer recently because I sat on my old one. Um, so this was actually a question that, or a thought that Annalisa and I were mulling over we recently went to the Arctic Circle um, to work on a piece of Annalisa's um, and speaking with some of the indigenous folks in Norway, uh, Sami. And so we kind of got around to this question of thinking of theater as an ecology and also thinking of projects as ecological projects. And I think that maybe the most challenging part for me at least was trying to decenter activity um, when thinking about the theater process because it's so reliant on deadlines and dates and contracts and um, these sorts of like really rigid structures and so when thinking about as an ecology through an ecology standpoint I um, you know I, I think about how we might start envisioning our work in our field as a landscape of interactions and the way that that actually opens up for a lot more possibilities in terms of how people can interact um, in the theater world. Because I, I'm, coming, I'm coming kind of from the performance art side of things and the installation art side of things. So sometimes I feel like maybe my work doesn't really fit into the, the boundaries around theater. But when we, when we stop thinking of it as such a a static object, like this is what theater is, and start thinking of the way that it weaves together, I think it opens a lot more, opens up a lot more possibilities in terms of where theater happens, who takes part in it, who witnesses it, how we remember it. So um, maybe decentering recording as the primary way that we, um, that we remember how productions happen. So those were just some of my initial thoughts based on that question. Thank you. Anybody else have any? One of the one of the things that I I was thinking about in terms of and what I thought was interesting that you said was um, that you said when you said uh, of interaction because I think that for me personally the tricky thing is when I try and figure out how to um, maintain like the the specificity like. Um, 
continuing to indigenize while thinking about things as an ecology. Mm -hmm. I really like that phrase, landscape. So. Yeah, I'd say for um, myself and our company, Indigenous Direction, that I'm here representing, um, yeah, because we're not talking about, we're not interested in decolonizing. We're, our specific purpose is indigenizing space, and which is a very different thing um, in many ways. So the question, so I'm kind of like, mm, I'm not sure how to answer the question. This is not something we're really that interested in. Um, that's what our company was created specifically to indigenize spaces. And then I just, I'm looking up like what ecology actually is defined as. And it's so, it makes me a, very uncomfortable. It's so much about sets of relationships and things that exist and studying and dealing with relations and interactions. It's not actually about action. So that to me makes it a very troubling term. Um, as a noun, it's a branch biology dealing with the relations and interactions between organisms and their environment. Um, it's a set of relationships existing, you know, and so I'm really not interested in the set of relationships that currently exist. Um, and so, and it's just such a non, it's just, it's a noun, right? So it's not an action word and, and not that it needs to be, I don't know. Anyway, it's just a word that concerns me because it's so um, about naming things and, and quantifying things as opposed to about doing things. And so that's my non-response to your question because I don't re-respond. Like neither of those things is interesting to me, decolonizing or ecology. Larissa, yeah. would you mind, would you uh, describe what indigenizing means for your, for your company and your work? Oh, so many things. Cause we're working, um, it just depends cause we're a consulting company. So um, it changes depending on every organization we're working with. Um, sometimes we're working with indigenous communities, a lot of times, some favorite times. Um, and then we're more, um, uh, then it just depends on that community. We've been asked to um, work with indigenous, we've been asked, we, we do whatever we're asked to do basically. And we ask them what they need. And so for instance, we've worked in a particular indigenous community that did say, um, we have all our past training in theater has been about um, making us ready for Western theater. And we really aren't interested in that. And we just want to write our own stories for our own people. Can um, you kind of help us do these? Uh, we did some, they wanted specifically writing workshops, but done in a way that was um, completely <laughs> pulling them away from that scene, just helping them as an outside voice look at what they were doing and saying, Hmm, is that really how you did things? Is why are you doing it? This just helping to ask the questions so that that particular indigenous community could um, see where they had internalized the Western um, gaze and and were trying to fulfill it in their own work and and even in their own traditional stories they'd realize how many times they're doing that. So that was one particular thing that we were asked to do, and so that was indigenizing it by just asking them a lot of questions and helping them, um, you know, because they'd asked us to do this to get back to. Um, their original voices. Um, we work in a lot of white institutions and um, then it's a huge array of things depending on where they are and whether it's we're being hired for a particular project or we're being hired, hired to create a particular program or work generally with institution. And then we start with even teeny tiny things like, I mean, it sounds silly, but you know, having a land recognition in the lobby, having elder seating in the lobby, um, changing the way they uh, approach ticketing, uh, way, the way they approach um, patrons and, and understanding of family and allowing families into the theater, um, you know, making sure that baby, you know, four generations are always welcome and it's accessible, like starting from the very beginning of the ground of it and then working all the way through it, all the way up to seasons and artists and all that. So it's a wide variety of things. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I, I also had to look up the word ecology. Um, I, <laughs> um, as me, the, uh, thank you for sharing that, Larissa. It actually is making me just want to raise the question of, because I'm sure that this is something that people in this group have been thinking about to some degree, and I don't really know where the answer might fall in people, but is there such a thing as, what is decolonizing if not indigenizing? Uh, uh, that that's a really provocative question that I don't have an answer to but I will say that the, the concept of indigenizing um, 
and even the word indigenous doesn't come up that often in we're, the the work that I do with Maya directors, which is a um, very, we're very inspired by indigenous direction uh, and and um, particularly by the um, by Larissa what Larissa and Ty initially said about why they started indigenous direction, which was so that when people emailed them asking them to do work for free, they could say, my consulting company would be happy to give you a quote about that work. Um, so now we have a, a bunch of um, Middle Eastern directors who are doing that same thing, which is, which is awesome. Uh, but I, what's your timeline? What's your budget? Is like written on the top of it. But anyway, uh, well, I, the, my mind is a little bit blown by that question because I don't know that, I don't know that, I'm not sure I can articulate the difference and yet um, indigenizing or being indigenous is, feels like an incredibly complicated concept for me personally um, because of the, the, the sort of many, many layers of colonization and displacement that are involved in the history of my family and the families of the people, the other people who are part of Maya directors. Um, and, and so I haven't even, I, I, th I have a feeling that it would actually re be really powerful for me to, to think about that idea of in indigenousness in terms of the land that, um, that I get, that I come from. Um, but right now, so much of our, uh, I guess connection, the way that the four of us managed to connect comes from the common experience of colonization um, and trying to figure out how to um, be together um, in, uh, in, con in connecting back like aesthetically and, and professionally in our work as artists to um, a sense of Middle Eastern or um, Manasa, Middle Eastern, North African, South Asian identity. Uh, because for us, and I can imagine it's maybe the same for a lot of other people, once you start getting into thinking about the specific land, um, other people who are sitting around the table with me and Maya directors, I think of as the colonizer. <laughs> um, I'm Armenian. There's a Turkish guy sitting next to me. Mm -hmm. I think the question is absolutely a fascinating one. And just for myself, um, I feel like it would be inauthentic of me to show up in a space and say, I am indigenizing this space because I do not have a personal, cultural, lived experience as someone who is indigenous. Uh, I do not have um, any uh, roots or affiliations with any indigenous groups, though most certainly I am descendant of many. Um, I do feel like I have um, um, some tools uh, or, or some practices that can help decolonize space, or I certainly show up uh, with a mindset towards uh, decolonizing a space that I that I understand. And I think if I walked in and said I want to indigenize this space, uh, I would be co-opting somebody else's uh, lived experience, and it and it would be just uh, rhetorical. And, and not meaningful, actually. Um, though in some cases, the two may in fact be one and the same, um, but not in my case. I would like to, if it's all right, share a, um, a description from an article written by Eve Tuck. Um, and I'm avoiding the word definition, but uh, it's from this article, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, from 2012 by Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang, and they say, our goal in this article is to remind readers what is unsettling about decolonization. Decolonization brings about the repatriation of indigenous land and life. It is not a metaphor for other things we want to do to improve our societies and school, uh, schools. And so they go on um, to elaborate on the ways in which decolonization, decolonization, decolonization is not a metaphor. And so this is kind of the document that I go back to a lot when trying to meditate on decolonization because over and over again, they reassert the idea that um, indigenous sovereignty and land repatriation must always be a part of the decolonial project or projects. Mm. And 
um, going back to the term ecology, um, I definitely agree that the English word ecology is is very inert because it assumes a static set of relationships in a in a landscape. Um, the, the closest word in Kataba to ecology would be Yemon, which is big family, like a large inclusive idea of family, uh, which often includes other than human beings. Um, and this is a very active word, right? Because family structures change over time and that there's this act of growing together with one another. So when a new child is in the family, the relationships are also new to that child, right? Because it's a new being. And so there's also always this process of kind of growing together um, in an ecology and sometimes growing apart too. That's a, that's also a big part of ecology. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of where I'm, I'm coming from with the, with that term. Thank you all for, those are very, um, very, very, um, provocative answers. I also think the, the piece of it that, um, whenever I, I like sort of, since I, whenever I linger on ecology, I, I sort of like default actually to, to ecosystem and to being like, okay, like what is the way that this term is actually a, a way of talking about, um, like the way that like I've, I've been in settings where like something is termed deep ecology, which like within indigenous cultures is just like the way we relate to all beings. It doesn't, it doesn't need that term, but that that's the closest thing that, that like that circle has to being able to describe that. Um, and so I think, I think one of the things that's really, that's been really interesting about um, the depth and specificity of all of your answers so far is like how many layers there are to even just unpacking the fact that we are all having this conversation in English. Um, so there's so many kinds of work um, to be done. Yeah, the other thing I was going to say, I, I just, I'm, I'm taking the time to do a lot of Googling here. Um, <laughs> I think my big, my big problem here is that like, I guess if we were actually talking, so the first definition of the word decolonize is a verb to withdraw from a, withdraw from a colony, leaving it independent. Like, I'm 100% down with that, but that's not what we're talking about. Right. We're talking about some watered down, completely like bullshit, undefinable version of decolonize. So if we were to actually talk about decolonizing, just for the record, two thumbs up, but that's not what we're talking about at all. I don't even know what we're talking about when we say decolonize in theater. I really don't have a clue because we don't mean that. Yeah. And I'll just point out that um, decolonization, well, based on that specific definition that we just heard, um, decolonization is a long process beyond getting rid of the colonizer, um, especially in South Asia, and just because we were talking about language, um, I think we, uh, I talked about this in the piece as well that we wrote. Um, the, the way uh, language, especially English, because we were colonized by the British for so long, the way English is ingrained in how we relate to other segments of society, people who don't speak English, people um, who speak native languages, or uh, people who might even speak a slew of languages, because most people in South Asia do. Um, relating to that, there's a whole process of once the colonizer has left, there is a whole lot of work to be done uh, in terms of uh, figuring out what your national or um, community identity is, um, okay. even if there is a collective one. Uh, answering that question of, is there something that we can all agree to, or is that something that we have to work towards? Uh, I see that in South Asia, especially in Pakistan, a lot where people... Um, we as a country still haven't figured out um, what our um, collective political psychology is, for instance, because a lot of our political systems have just been uh, inherited by what the British left us. So just defining colonization, decolonization as just getting rid of the colonizer, I think, is, is a little limiting because the work is of decolonization essentially begins once the colonizer leaves because uh, you have to go into unpacking, in our case, centuries of um, learned self-hatred and uh, systems that have kept us in a certain place. To get people out of that mindset, I think, is the larger 
purpose of decolonization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to, I wanted to affirm and, and follow up with that. And Larissa, I'm really grateful for the way in which you're unpacking definitions and terminology, because I do feel like it's, it's blowing my mind in the best possible way in terms of what does decolonization actually mean and how are we referring to it in, in the theater practice. And um, when I, you know, I've had, a, unfortunately, a pretty limited experience with India, but when I was able to work there and live there, it was, um, it was really challenging to, you know, hear from artists, their encounters around exactly what Issa was saying in terms of, you know, either directly through the effects of coloni colonization, the censorship or the elimination of, um, you know, of, of art forms and of um, cultural uh, elements that were really the landscape of the country and what it means now to be in a country where the most popularly produced playwright is Shakespeare and kind of reconciling with the fact that even with, you know, efforts from artists to really examine what is, you know, what is colonialism and is what, it, what it's reclaiming and what is uh, our, our identity as an arts, you know, as an artist or an arts organization, the the landscape, the way in which the culture has shifted and the way in which the culture, you know, will continue to unpack the effects of colonialism. So, yeah, I mean, I think I, what I'm really curious about is what, what is decolonizing in, in the sense of what we're speaking to, you know, what does it mean in terms of what are decolonizing efforts and practices, um, knowing that what you said, Larissa, in terms of that definition, that's, that's very different <laughs> than what's, what's actually happening. I think it may also be important to to make a distinction between like classically colonized countries like South Asia where the colonizer theoretically did leave mm -hmm. and settler communities, which the United yes. States is a settler colonized country, right? So like the question I think in settler communities is did the colonizer actually leave? And I think the that the answer for us here in, on Turtle Island is no. Um, so it's actually a quite different conversation right. between the South Asian context and then the context here in, in the United States. Totally. And of course, I mean, from my standpoint, friends are complicated by um, the African slave trade because when we, when we talk about things like um, repatriation, or the colonizer removing themselves, um, you know, that, that leaves me <laughs> and the people I'm descended from um, even further displaced. You know, I, I can't tell you from where in West Africa I am descended. I can't tell you what, what language that was and what culture or tribal affiliations. Um, so, so, so when I think about, like, decolonization uh, as a theater practice, I certainly am thinking of many of the things that Larissa named in terms of the consulting work, where it's like, how do you uh, work with the community to kind of um, uh, unpack that ingrained Western practices of this is how we must write a play. Um, this is who, how a rehearsal room must be led and this is who must be in charge and this is, this is how many weeks you get. So, so when I'm talking about um, decolonizing, uh, I, I will admit that it's not linked to really any dictionary definition because for me, it's all an exploration at trying to actually get back to something that I don't entirely know what it is, right? It's all about um, trying to um, l learn that uh, as part of the process and trying to have an awareness of other cultural forms, other cultural traditions, doing that research and integrating that into my, into my practice. Um, and of, and of course it, you know, uh, Amritha named it, you know, Shakespeare has become like this global beacon. So it's also like, okay, I'm doing this work and then I'm trying to understand what's happening in, in theaters in West Africa. And it's, oh, well they're, they want to do Western plays. So, <laughs> So the impact of colonialism is long and deep, and um, and for some of us uh, who were who are here by means of involuntary transport, um, the the order is very tall to to actually name what what decolonization would look like. Um, 
because I have no, I have no land, you know. Mm -hmm. I wanted to follow up on that. Thank you uh, for sharing that, Don. And I don't want to equate our experiences um, because they are very different and unique in their own ways. But it, what you were saying about, you know, I don't know what that would actually look like um, resonated for me. I work for my tribe's language revitalization program and our food sovereignty program. So I spent a lot of time teaching the language and working on the language. I spent a lot of time planting plants and um, teaching people how to care for them and harvest from them. And in both of those cases, we are operating from a situation where we actually have lost um, a huge amount of that sort of cultural material. Um, we do still obviously have things left over, but you know, every single day I'm uh, faced with these linguistic questions of like, well, how would we say, how would Kataba say this thing? Um, and part of that, part of that tension is that of course all languages change, right? And we don't know exactly how they, how Kataba's in the past would have said it. So we can only ever do what we can do in the present moment, right? And that goes back to actually how the Kataba language is structured in that there is no past or present tense. Um, everything is always, I mean, there's no past or future tense, there's always the present tense. Um, and so, you know, I think that for the first year that I was doing this job, I was really frozen by the lack, the things that we lacked, the things that were missing, like how how does one harvest the Catalpa tree? How does one um, say this certain kind of uh, sentiment in the language? And now I've just kind of flipped over to, well, it doesn't, you know, we don't know a lot of things, but we are in this present moment and we have to be working towards um, something in the future. And I think that comes back to this question about decolonization, indigenization, um, and all these large terms. And I think in general, I want to resist any sort of overarching philosophy um, towards, towards this work because I think it, I think it always rely, it, it's always dependent on the individuals involved in it. And to be clear, when I say individuals, I'm not speaking about humans. I'm speaking about all beings, um, both animate and not animate. Um, and so every single solution or resolution or ecology or family that is created through this work is going to look really different depending on the context, um, depending on the present moment and the past moment um, and what comes in there in the future. But yeah, I, I really jive what you're saying about how do we move forward if we don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. um, I had a really interesting conversation when when I was doing the interviews for the, the piece. By the way, awesome week of Good stuff, you guys. Um, mm -hmm. That was really uh, exciting. It is really exciting. Um, when I was talking to uh, Michael Garces at Cornerstone, uh, I think at some point in the conversation, he he was he was saying, "If you're doing this work, if you care, if you care about." Uh, actually being responsive to what's around you, which to some extent, I guess, is how I think of ecology. Um, and that, that there's no, like, there's no stability. There's no, or there can be no organizational stability because um, the actual definition of like ecology and responsiveness is that everything is always changing. Um, so actually like all institutional structures basically are threatened by a, <laughs> a more responsive way of thinking and he feels every day that he's that he is it's his it's his mission to think that way and also he feels like he's putting his staff in kind of an impossible position because he's asking them to be invested in and work really hard for a structure that he's always questioning <laughs> and saying like at any minute we could decide this doesn't serve us and we have to dismantle it, which means you don't have a job. Um, and I said something to him like, uh, like, well, I guess in the midst of, and we, you know, we're talking about the world too and, you know, shit. And that he, he's, I said something, well, I guess you just have to find 
some kind of peace or you know some way of making peace as you move through this and he's he was like no he's like <laughs> he's like i think if you're gonna like be with any of this you actually never feel any peace hmm. you just feel in it and it's hard and i get i, I don't know if that relates to this but both what you know, Rue, Ru, what you were just saying, and Don, what you were saying in response to Larissa about, like, yeah, I'm all for the thing where the, the, the definition of decolonization, where the colonizer leaves. <laughs> um, but that's not, I mean, well, I don't know. I, I don't think that's what we have or what we're talking about here. And so I, there's a part of me that think slash fears that Michael is right and that the whole thing is just, if, if you're actually going to be in a space of really seeing all of this for what it is and working towards the things that I, that we believe in, it's going to be really painful constantly and destabilizing. And I think that was something that kept coming up for me as I was reading all of the pieces. Um, this week is this sort of sense of like, fuck. Oh. <laughs> I think that, um, well, Megan, what you just said about um, the idea of ecology of, as, as eternally changing, I think that is an important part of how um, we approach theater or any kind of art making in general um, because sensitivities will always shift um, from one place to another, uh, and art, in a way, needs to find a way to reconcile um, between these changing modes. Uh, and in, in a number of ways, it becomes about moving people um, from one way of thinking or um, one ecology, for that matter, to another. Uh, and when we were talking, uh, when we started with the initial question of what are pitfalls of uh, thinking about uh, theater and ecology. Um, I, what I fear at times is that there is a set structure um, while we're uh, talking about change. Um, there, there can be certain hierarchies that are put in place. And what that tends to do is to make our work harder in terms of decolonizing, but that you know, it, 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 it will suppress certain voices regardless of how much we try. So in that sense, it is absolutely a painful, dissatisfying process. Um, because no matter who is in, uh, in the center, um, the whole idea, uh, the whole process of decentering um, one community or one perspective uh, means that at some point, we're going to have the con have to have the conversation of uh, we need do we need that decentering process to keep going uh, in, perpetually uh, for us to make, get to a point of equilibrium. Does that make sense? Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I just keep thinking. You know, when Larissa talked about the one of the groups she's consulting with, where, where it's so true. All of my training has been in a Western theater mode following this model. Uh, I, I'm a director, right? And so the director certainly is supposed to sit at the top and have this vision. And we use words like my cast and my show and my designers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and none of that language is, is moving this conversation forward. None of that is useful. How can we uh, decenter the director, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yet that's vocationally the thing that I do and it's the thing that I'm expected to do when I'm hired um, at places. So it is absolutely uh, uh, uncomfortable and destabilizing and, and I'm met with a lot of challenges when I try and show up and say, I, I, you know, this process I'm in right now on the first day, somebody said something like the way Dawn runs a room. And I said, I don't run a room. That's not what I do. I don't even like that language. Um, so just even little, just little things like that and how, and how theater, the language we even use, uh, like we are going to have to be in a place of constant, constant 
evolution to, to break all of that down. Um, and, and the army right now feels small. Um, it, it still feels like that it is about how do I get to the, to the top? Um, and then the idea that, well, if I'm at the top, then I can do the work, but like, Mm -hmm. how can, how can we there be no top? Mm -hmm. How can we not need anybody at the top for the work to happen? Mm -hmm. And maybe I shouldn't be using the term decolonize. Uh, maybe I should just be saying I'm really trying to disrupt systems of uh, white supremacy. Maybe that's the, the term I should be using. Um, in my mind, I'm trying to do all of that. I mean, um, I'd, I'd say that is decolonization. <laughs> I'm just going to jump in with, I think, I mean, I think also, John, part of that is, is right, if we're, if we're dealing with, again, English language decolonize as the opposite of colonize, like, that is a very English language binary that we've been handed. Like, those are the only two things. Then it's like steps towards one system or step towards another, when actually the thing that we're dealing with is so much more complicated than that. I was also just going to uplift real quick, just um, into what Megan was saying, um, that I I can't speak to any of the other communities Cornerstone's been working with, but for five years now I've been working with them with indigenous communities and indigenizing their process, very specifically indigenizing the Cornerstone process um, on two different plays I'm doing with them, and Michael Garces has been a part of that, and I know um, a lot of the difficulty he's speaking of definitely for the company here at Cornerstone was around the plays that I'm doing, which are... um, um, as much as possible, fully indigenized spaces. Um, and so I can say the good news is, though, in what Michael said, was at least in our case, it was a, like, 98% successful process for the indigenous community. So when she talks about it being difficult, it's like, yes, it was difficult for the Western established Cornerstone Theater Company, who's following mm. an extremely white-centric way of working. It was really hard on them, even if they're not white people, that's the structure they're working in. It was awesome for the Native people. Like, mm. it's been amazing five years and it's been amazing and it continues to be so just want to uplift that yes it was hard on them but it's been great for the people on whose land they're standing following up i love that that's great um following up on that i there was a there's a great podcast that i love listening to called media indigena mostly because i can listen to listen to my favorite scholar kim Tallbear speak on there like every other week um and they were just speaking about this negotiation process in the Canada context right now regarding um, payments to folks who went through the boarding school system in Canada. And basically the, the state was like, oh, here's some money. And people were saying that's nowhere near enough to, for us to be able to rebuild our education systems with it um, or to make the damage less excruciating. Um, and what she said was, I think what the Canadian state will find, and I think this applies to all sorts of settler structures, is it's going to be very costly and uncomfortable um, to go through any sort of decolonial processes. And I think that that's, I mean, that this goes right back to privilege, right? Like, it seems like this is an anguishing sort of process for them to go through to not have, not to center their ways of doing it. But like you're saying, the flip side is that it's a nurturing um, sort of process for the community that we're actually trying to refocus on. And I really liked what um, Issa was saying earlier, and then also Don about this, and Megan about this, um, about the constantly changing process. And I think that it might be useful to distinguish that from chaos, uh, that there is this constant shifting and changing. I'm going to keep using metaphors from my, my land because that's where I am. Um, but today on the river, even when we were stopping to look at the spider lilies, for example, the, the boat is still shifting and moving and side to side, even if we're in the same place, right? Similarly, in my gardens, um, the eastern redbud is the first tree that blooms, and so I harvest flowers from it during March. But then the rest of the year, my relationship to it changes, but it comes back. And so I think um, maybe distinguishing the language of change um, from the idea of chaos um, might be useful because there's a way in which things can constantly be shifting and we're adjusting um, and so in a sense changing 
while there's still being this larger sense of stability through through this close knit network of of lives. And there's a quote from so my group um, we we were talking about text and work to communication, um, and so we did a, a podcast for our contribution this week. And so I just wanted to share something that one of my collaborators, Mia Susan Amir, said. Um, she's from Vancouver. She's working in Vancouver, um, and she focuses on um, crip theater and uh, crip studies. And so she, I'm going to paraphrase here, but she said, "What? Um, how? How can we pause the process?" so that we can focus on the relationships of the folks that are actually in the room. Like, how do we not let process be so important that the realities of our relationships must fall under the process? And so she was speaking specifically about, well, what about people who are in the room who say, I am not well today? Mm -hmm. How does that reality, how does that reality of relationship change the way that we make theater in that day or that week or that month or the entire process? Um, so that we don't say, well, I'm sorry you're feeling bad, but we have to do X, Y, and Z uh, today. And so how, how might we approach those that hierarchy differently? I'll throw something else out there, <laughs> <laughs> which is I just saw a great article yesterday about architecture, and I cannot remember the person who's studying it, or I think they're in a Pueblo community in the Southwest, um, but they're studying um, their traditional architecture and trying to understand how we might re-indigenize architecture. And it got me on this process of thinking, um, and I think that they use the terminology re-indigenized specifically, but I can't remember. Um, and it made me think about the way that we, even anyone approaches architecture, but I think since we're talking about theater, theater specifically, and in the U.S. at least, it's always focused on this kind of conservation model where the, where the, um, the presupposition is that the healthiest ecosystems are the ecosystems without humans involved in them, uh, which is, of course, a very white supremacist way of looking at it because my community has lived on these lands for millennia and lived on a way lived in a way that we didn't just prevent damage, but we actually promoted the rich interweaving of life, right? We promoted the biodiversity, we promoted the well-being of our relatives. And so just on like a very practical level, as theaters commission new buildings, uh, as theaters look for new buildings, how can we shift the model from, oh, well, is this, you know, LEED certified? Is it energy efficient? To a model of well, how can we build a structure that actually promotes the well-being of the ecosystem around us, both socially in terms of humans, but also between species and for the the environment, the ecology, the landscape as a whole. I think what you just said is is huge, not just in terms of, um, I guess, not just in terms of the landscape and, well, okay, so you know, so. You, I, this is inarticulate, so I'm sorry for a second. But um, uh, I was thinking about what you said about about change and about structures and about sort of the idea that certain structures are more stable. And something I've been thinking about a lot lately is actually how the, the, the institutions of the American theater uh, structurally and financially actually aren't very stable because they have this tendency to just only grow in one direction. Uh, and not necessarily to always check in with their community about what their community needs, but um, to operate in some ways very similarly to other capitalist models that um, are constantly building bigger theaters but aren't necessarily making sure that a bigger theater is actually serving um, the people and therefore ultimately going to be sustainable. And so I think that there's something um, really beautiful about the fluidity you described in applying these traditional models to theater to also acknowledge not only... Um, is like change an organic thing but like the world we live in isn't magically in certain structures more stable even if we we have taught ourselves that it is i was also thinking 
interesting, I think change is such an interesting thing to interrogate in this conversation. Um, and, and I say this with, you know, full support of the word, the definition, the practice, uh, you know, but how so much of, you know, change that I often find myself in dealing with is actually a process of dismantling where it's where the change itself is actually reaching back to something that was inherently an you know an, an original practice or a compassionate practice or something rooted in what we're speaking to and it feels like change because that has been uh that has been dominated but there's something about to me the the interesting conversation around like what you said Rue, which is so beautiful of you know through mia's words of the responsiveness responsiveness of change in the process and then also how i feel change interacts with you know um with a compassionate form of how do we actually get back to something that never really was lost but feels like it's been dominated or taken over so it may feel like change for those who have not encountered that practice or know it within their tradition or origin but it's actually something that's rooted in, you know, our ancestry. Yeah, I mean, I think that it feels like you know, now we're at that place in the conversation of like, well, in whose interests is it to convince us that a certain kind of change is undesirable? And in whose interests is us, is it to have us imagine that a certain kind of structure is the only stable one? And, mm -hmm. you know, the, the questions in that, in that, um, the conversation around the Brooklyn Mu Museum about like, whose interests are actually controlling this institution. Um, and I mean, I don't know how, if we're talking about the, the quote unquote ecology, problematic as that is, of the American quote unquote American, I don't know, quotes around everything, um, of, the, of the theater ecology that uh, some of us are presently sitting in. Um, and I know, you know, Don, you were talking about how you uh, move in institutions as an artist, and I, everything you're saying is uh, resonated very, very deeply with me in terms of the conversations that I have to have as a director as well. Um, but I guess the, the the thing that keeps like provoking me is is the is the question of how you. Like, how do you ethically collaborate in a system that doesn't have your best interests at heart? You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if the, if the things that are controlling the system, if the system has a sort of vested interest or the, the, the institutions that we're working in or with have, have a vested interest in um, maintaining structures and ideas that are like d directly intended to not connect back to the places that we come from or aren't interested in incorporating our truths in some kind of way. What does that mean? <laughs> How do we work? I mean, aside from working to indigenize um, and, to, and to decolonize, which but I guess my bigger question is like, can you even, what does that mean to do that in, a, in, in, in these places that are so invested in the opposite? This is the thing that I've spent my whole career trying to reconcile, right? Because it's like, I hate the game, but I'm playing the game. Um, and, and, uh, and I sometimes, get a lot of personal sadness because I want to um, not need the system or operate within the system. So I've convinced myself that I'm subverting from the inside. I don't know if it's true, but it's the thing that I, that I have kind of um, made central to my mission is that for whatever little opportunity I have to um, 
promote a different practice, encourage a different way of, of thinking, um, uh, in so much as I have the space to do so, that's what I'm trying to do. But I, I honestly don't, don't know the answer. And some days it's like, I got to just get out. Like some days it really feels like I got to stop doing this. Mm -hmm. Um, and then other days it's like, but, uh, but I, I'm so passionate about stories and we will always need stories. We will always tell stories. Um, so how, how can I create the space, find the space, be with other people in the space and, 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 and tell true stories. Um, so I try and just focus on that work, but man, some days it's like effing hard because it's like, Oh, I am in collusion with the enemy. That is what it feels like some days that mm -hmm. I am actually doing the enemy's work. Um, uh, so I'm constantly checking myself and my practice and I don't, I don't have an answer. Yeah, I think it's, I have and feel that struggle. And I think it's such a great question, Megan, in terms of, you know, I've worked between so many different institutions and systems and companies and modalities of operating in the field. And, and even within that, I still feel really limited and, you know, still feel also really, um, challenged and conflicted with you know my purpose and role in in the theater and what happens when I am at you know a major institution like the Oregon Shakespeare Festival and I found the the similarity for me that's just kind of traveled and and I say this not knowing if it um if it it doesn't really resolve that question for me but I found myself gravitating towards people and company members and then figuring out how do we work within you know, these different settings or models. And so ultimately with a place like OSF, I really gravitated towards the company and then was like, oh, how do we deal with the institution? But it's something that, yeah, I think that there's deep, I feel the deep introspection and analysis of, you know, what is my role in the field and what am I doing personally and how is it serving my artistry and how is it serving my culture and, you know, and, and really having this constant identity crisis around um, what is, you know, what is, what's the ethics and the, um, the, the belief system and practice and what are the ways in which that inherently relates to, you know, my, my sense of, you know, survival in the field. And I don't mean just even literal survival in terms of, you know, food on the table and a roof over my head as important as that is, or, you know, having a place to, to actually be able to, you know, support myself and my family. But, in terms of just, you know, artistic survival and creative survival, like what does it mean to be fulfilled? What does, it, what does it mean to be inspired by change? And I think within that, you know, I I do feel some passion and desire, as Don spoke to, to, you know, be in spaces where I can act, a, you know, with a certain level of just, you know, truth to myself and, and hope that that carries meaning in some way but it's it's true that I feel like I I'm in a particular moment of really analyzing that and also really analyzing the field that I've been a part of and thinking you know both in this country and in other countries um what does it mean to actually be an artist what does it mean to actually practice uh in in a way that supports one's um one's belief system as an artist, knowing that we live under particular conditions and structural biases and barriers and systems of oppression that have made being an artist freely and openly very challenging. So I think your question just evokes a lot of questions in the best possible way. <laughs> Um, I'd also say it's also, obviously, it's, you know, really different for playwrights like Mary Catherine and myself um, in that, you know, we just, you know, we're in a different position as far as being the creators of the work. So um, I'm just creating the work I want to create and people do it or they don't. <laughs> Unfortunately, they want to do it. So yay. Um, but I do say, I mean, I would say even in that, I mean, I really, hell is some of you know, um, you've gotten my lecture. Um, I, I really push um, young artists in the field and primarily playwrights because of this because of the structure of western theater that america follows um we have a tremendous amount of privilege 
And so um, for my very first play, because I didn't know, I didn't go to school for playwriting, so I didn't know what a playwright's supposed to do. And I came from film and TV, which was just a wasteland of horror, you know, as far as the kind of community work I wanted to do. So um, theater has been amazing compared to, I mean, it's incredible. Um, so, uh, so, you know, re- relative to that, uh, my career in theater has been amazing as far as them letting me do the kind of work I want to do that I wasn't allowed to do in film and TV. Um, even as the creator of my own shows and TV. Um, so that, that's a difference. But I'd also so shout out to theater. Yay, you're better than film and TV. Um, but I, I would say that, you know, I, I always have, for my first play, since I didn't know what a playwright was or what they did when I got commissioned, um, I, from my first play to now, I challenge every theater I work with to do, this is just my personal practice, and I'm just using it as an example of, like, where playwrights can use their power. I, I challenge every theater I work with that they, I cannot be the only indigenous art in that season, and I cannot be the only indigenous artist being paid in that season, mm-hmm. or the indigenous person being paid, because sometimes mm-hmm. it's a consultant or whatever. Um, I just did that because that just is what we do as community members. Um, you always, you know, bring others with you. It's just automatic. Um, and it's something I've, I continue to do, and it's been really beautiful to see theater. For me, every theater has embraced that challenge, mm-hmm. those two challenges, and has gone 100% into them and has created these incredible community partnerships and uplifted new artists and, you know, all these incredible things. Um, Poppy Wilson was just from 1491s, was just reminding me that we commissioned him um, in my very first play to do mm-hmm. a big, to do a big, uh, uh, big, big mistake, a, a live um, paint. He was a graffiti artist then, and we commissioned him to a huge live paint in the lobby during the play. Um, not a good idea when, you know, the air is being sucked into the theater, just FYI, um, people <laughs> <laughs> nearly died. Um, so there you go. There's that. But, uh, but it was a beautiful piece and it sold and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, I, I, so anyway, I just would say I, it's interesting for me to listen to you all talking about it, especially as directors and, and, um, more in, in less, in, not in the uh, playwright role, because I, I don't know about Mary Catherine, how you feel about it, but I, for me, it's been pretty awesome and I've made my choice to, to work in this to me I just I made my choice I want to work in this field I'm a, I'm a I'm writing you know I know I'm writing to white people those are the people I need I need we need white folks there's a lot of them so um for me it, it, it's a positive yeah I, I totally I agree and I think it's been a very good conversation and these are tough tough issues and I don't know I've, I've been kind of silent because I don't have um any real like judgments or strong thoughts on the answer to the question I just I know why I do what I do but um you know everyone has to come at it kind of from their own um perspective and and I don't you know I don't think any of us are wrong or right um but it yeah I mean it's tough like I mean if you're a native artist telling a story on this soil today you are telling a story that has been purposely silenced and the legal framework that the, you know, United States has created and the Supreme Court has created wouldn't be possible, wouldn't exist if we hadn't been silenced. And of course you have to have it at the same time. You can't, you can't just silence. You have to also dehumanize. And so that's why we have red face and um, a Washington football team named after a term that was literally a, a legal mechanism to graduate genocide. So, you know, um, storytelling is powerful. And I think, um, it's, it, it really is a powerful tool for change. And I, that's why I think some of these conversations are so hard to have because there is so much power, um, inevitably in who gets to share stories and why and how. And, and so here we are, people who are culturally conscious and trying to do the right thing by our communities and, you know, what words we use can be such a complex conversation, but I think we all approach it with such care and love and that's actually kind of the beautiful thing, right? Is that um, we don't want to do harm with our work. And so we're being so intentional with it. Um, but then at the same time, despite our intentionality and, and the fact that we're all incredibly intentional, you know, even within our own communities, we can sometimes use language that harms or perpetuate a certain colonial framework of doing things without even realizing it. So a lot of times I just try to stay open to learning um, with the recognition that you know, we all have so much to learn. So I know that's sort of like a wishy-washy response, but um, it's basically like I, I agree with everything that's been said and 
um, just appreciate the space to even be able to have this conversation because I think um, the fact that, that there is a, a pretty mainstream, I mean, we're, I know we're not totally mainstream here, but this is not the oblivion. This conversation is, you know, <laughs> my head bopping at the beginning of the tape. It probably made it onto Twitter, so someone saw that. Um, you know, the, this conversation is taking place is pretty amazing, I think, um, for the American, for the state of the American theater today. Mm. I, I, I like Mary Catherine. I like what you said about um, that we're not that we're not intending to do harm, and that we're sort of constantly uh, evaluating that. Um, which I, I appreciate. I appreciate everyone's like generous response to my little like disp you know despairing temper tantrum. Uh, about how hard it all is, uh, and 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 I appreciate Larissa you saying like here's a here's a concrete strategy that I've used, and I think one of the the concrete strategies that that we've used the most in Maya directors, and that I try to use in my directing practice too, relates Mary Catherine to that thing that you said about um, checking in on what you're doing constantly. So we. We, we've, we, the four of us are, are kind of new at this. We've been doing it for about a year. And one of the things we've, we've started doing is like, uh, doing like, like a deep process debrief of every time we're in public together, like be, being like, so how was that for you? You know, how did you think I said, how was it when I said that? Did you feel like I was, was, you know, did you feel talked over? Did you feel interrupted? Did you feel it is crazy how much you learn from doing that mm -hmm. and getting a sense of like, these are the people that I'm working, that I'm working with. And these are the people that I'm trying to like, you know, storm the castle with. So we got to make sure that we're, um, because, you know, unconsciously all of that harm you can do to other people constantly. If you're not like thinking about it and talking about it and dealing with it is pretty, uh, significant. Mm -hmm. I don't, and, and I think especially in this situation, I mean, here we all are on this call together, trying to do this work together. Um, but the, the forces of history and, you know, particularly the, those of colonialism and white supremacy are, are always trying to divide us and give us less of a voice, mm -hmm. and, you know, turn us against each other. And that's particularly true for those of us who are, you know, who, who's, historically who have been pitted against each other in really particular ways, which is true of the four of us and Maya directors when we sit around a table, you know, we can come up with all kinds of historical, cultural, religious reasons that we should all hate each other. Mm -hmm. um, and so to, to actually, it's, it, it feels kind of, so I guess that's what I'm offering is my, like, maybe this is, this is part of what, you know, helps me sleep at night is knowing that, I can, I have a, I have a strategy for like talking about my own, my complicity in, um, in some of this stuff, even in my smallest interactions and also feel empowered to speak up and say like, Hey, you said, you said my idea without giving me credit for it right. or whatever, whatever it is you, you know, she said she, she didn't feel well. And then you just talked over her for the rest of the meeting and never offered her a chance to, you know, some room to, to come back in or whatever it was, right. Uh, that, that I found so helpful and I've learned so much from that way of working. And it also takes a lot of time. I feel like Annalisa is smiling at me because I owe her a debrief from our time in the Arctic circle. Um, yeah, I really love what everyone's saying. And I think that you know, I, I have definitely felt that sort of like, oh, well, is this doing anything or is this doing something good? Um, and how do I know? And, and I think uh, reflecting back on what um, uh, Mary Catherine and Marissa were saying, you know, it's, you just kind of have to make a, a decision and, and go for it. Um, but I might offer some... A, a way of kind of approaching the language around this um, and 
course, you can take it or leave it or um, critique it or whatever. But maybe part of it is instead of thinking of focusing so much on do no harm, um, shifting the language to how can we actively promote growth or how can we actively promote maybe revitalization. Um, once again, I'm going to keep using plant metaphors because I love them. Um, but, you know, it's not, it's not so much how do I just not do harm to my corn, for example, but it's like how can I promote their well-being and growth in a way that doesn't, that also promotes the well-being and growth of other things. And so I also think that this language of do no harm relies on kind of, I think it sometimes relies on a static idea of the way things are, like, oh, these things are in this way and I don't want to hurt them. But if we're rejecting the idea of stasis and what Madeline pointed out, which is that even, even things that we think of as static aren't in fact static, but they're just constantly changing in a way that benefits a certain group of people. So if we reject the idea of stasis, how can we focus on growth towards um, goals that are um, more just, um, are more life-giving? Uh, that was just a thought I had. <laughs> Um, I just want to jump in and say something that um, Megan said that resonated with me because, um, and it sort of directly relates to some of the question you just asked for, um, because there is, there is something to be said about um, being conscious and present and um, listening to different perspectives in, uh, in, in the ecosystem, if we're going with that metaphor still. So. Um, something you said earlier about um, uh, about uh, change and chaos, the difference between the two, uh, and the one thing that keeps coming back to me um, is about seasons. There's always going to be uh, a certain time for a certain community or a certain way of thinking or um, just the way human beings behave with each other. Um, and it, that I relate to some of what Megan said earlier uh, because it's the only way to wade through those waters is to um, listen, which is something that I, um, in my playwriting work or even in my performance work, is something that I try to listen to and learn from other people um, how they practice or how they do a certain thing um, that either might not be a part of my practice or something I may not have um, known. Some uh, one. To, uh, I keep going back to um, this anecdote from when I uh, when I was when I was a child. I grew up in Nepal. Um, I uh, went to an Afghan Tibetan school, which was co the complete antithesis of what the, the the kind of upbringing that I had in the first six years of my life, because that was revolutionary. Um, but ending up in a school with Buddhist monks. Um, taught me a very different perspective on life in general. And I see that happening in my work as well, where I'm constantly questioning what everybody's already pointed out. Is this worth it? Is it worth, um, is it doing something significant? And um, I think the key to that uh, always is going to be the question of, are you listening? Are you asking the questions that need to be asked? Um, are you asking the little guy? Um, uh, instead of, you know, seeking validation from the structure and the system itself. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's something that kept coming back to me when I was listening to that point. I'm interested in this idea of listening, and I'm trying to, like, pull a bunch of friends together. Um, so I... Forgive me again. I'm I, I'm a little bit going to be articulate, inarticulate, but that's all right. Um, Rue, I think you said something earlier, quoting Mia maybe about this idea of relationship. Um, and Maddie and I were talking earlier today about communication, sort of as the opposite. Not that we need to stay with the binary, but of like communication is the opposite of colonization. So rather than like decolonize versus colonize, how can we actually be in relationship with each other as a sort of antidote to colonization? Like, I think Megan said something about how 
colonization is a structure that seeks to divide us and pit us against each other. So, um, Maddie, I, I want to throw this back to you to talk a little bit more about your ideas about communication. Because um, I feel like I've heard a bunch of people, different people say similar things uh, about how just the fact of this space being open for this communication amongst people who are in different levels of relationship and different kinds of relationship with each other. Yeah. Um, this metaphor has come up a lot uh, lately where it was just we were talking about, um, in a few different settings, the idea that uh, even with the series, um, sometimes uh, we wouldn't all be on exactly the same page. And Annalise would be like, well, I don't want to colonize them. And I'd be like, that person doesn't know, like, what's going on at all. Like, we have to still tell them what's going on, like at least a little bit, so that they feel like we're communicating with them. Um, and so figuring out what that boundary was between um, between like the amount of information you need, um, and sort of like a little bit of structure uh, that enables you to actually connect deeper, versus uh, you know feeling like you're imposing things on people. And so I wouldn't say that uh, communication and colonization are are opposites in any way, but I do think that we think about uh, ways of connecting a lot when it comes to them. And for me, I think the number one thing for whatever reason that I think of, probably I think a lot because, um, because my people's language is much more focused around everything being connected um, as opposed to separated. Uh, connection is the thing that I always come back to is the word and connection to me isn't, isn't so different from communication. It is how, how is everything, um, in sync with everything else and listening to everything else. Um, so that's, that's my starting, my score, my starting place, um, on, on the idea. But if any of you have thoughts ab about, about that, um, feel free to jump in. And I, I think it also comes back down to consent because I think that um, that is that is a, a central question to uh, you know my my life as an individual, but also my life as a citizen of Kitaba Indian Nation. Um, it really does come down to a lot of this about consent. Like that is arguably what we are what we want when we talk about sovereignty and self. I mean, self determination is problematic, but sovereignty. You know, is the right to say no. Uh, that's how the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, um, their fourth and sixth articles, that's how that's usually summarized, is the right to say no. And so I think that there's a way in which communication has often been done that's not consensual, you know, where it's like, this is the format, this is how we're doing it, um, show up or don't be a part of it, um, versus a process of offering and listening and responding, um, which, you know, should we talk, can we talk at two about this specific topic? Oh, well, I prefer to do this. You know, there's a way that it can be a lot more consensual and in that we can create healthier um, relationships and connections. That's great, yeah. I like all the C words. <laughs> Level of consonants. Accident consent versus colonization. Yes. <laughs> Crappy colonization. <laughs> I also worry. Oh, no, maybe I should. I, maybe I will say it actually. I also worry, like, too, about the. Um, I guess it, maybe it's only just come up for me for the first like time in this conversation because we're, we're able to sort of, we use the word so much in this conversation that we're able to laugh about it. Um, but this sort of, um, I guess, I guess levels of colonization and, and how, um, it, it actually in some ways sometimes makes, makes light of a thing that isn't, um, I don't know how to explain it, but it's like if communication and colonization are the same thing, they're not actually like it's a piece of a thing, right? But it's not. Um, uh, there are things I don't know how to explain it, but there's just something about that that's sitting with me a bit funny. Not about what you said, but about um, like these great things, like not great isn't good, like great isn't sort of like 
huge and immense and catastrophic things that happen to many of our peoples, right? Um, like we, we can we can make a, a comic about it to help people, hey, understand the system Hi. and that it's still happening, but it doesn't mean that um, that word still won't hold a lot of weight to some people uh, when you're comparing it to something simple in a, in a contemporary context. Can, can I do this? And I'm totally interrupted. I just want to say hi to everyone. This is hi, I'm down. Keep on going. Keep on. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Rob. Oh. <laughs> Look, we're already bringing people in. There you go. <laughs> I, should, I should have clarified with my comment before. Before we got Rob and then lost him, and now he's gone again. Oh. Um, <laughs> Uh, not not just happen, but are happening, and I think that that's sort of just the thing that I don't know. I just want to like call attention to to like the presence of what that still is in a way that isn't just something as simple as theater structures. A lot of the time, yes, and I, but I, you know, I think that also connects back to something I said towards the beginning, which is that I think that we lose something when we become too dedicated to the terminology. Um, in both directions. I think you're absolutely right that sometimes we get too metaphorical with terms and often lose the specific historical and ongoing realities that colonization enacts upon communities. But on the other side of it, I think that when we become too dedicated to any any of these terms, we often leave folks out. And this argument, I think, is often used for, like, why we need to, like, change the way we speak to bring in more white folks. But I think, for me, moving back to my reservation after having gone on this, going to get my bachelor's degree and then living in D.C. for a while, coming back, people don't use the terminology of decolonization or colonization. Um, they don't even use the terminology of indigenous in my community. Um, it's just not the way that people communicate. But that isn't to say that they aren't talking about these things. And so, mm -hmm. and I don't feel the need to say, oh, what you're speaking about is decolonization, because they already know what they're speaking about. And they're finding words to speak about it in a way that is useful and relevant to their context. And so, I think in general, I have a resistance to becoming too dedicated to any terminology, um, because of the way that it, it would force me to keep out some of my uh, relations. Mm -hmm. We got one minute. Is I was going to say, we're call? running close to time. Is someone, someone going to solve colonization in the next minute? <laughs> Can we solve it? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, we just need a solution. We got a minute. We just 60 second solution? Yeah. <laughs> oh, right, because we like to have deadlines and goals and, yes, and concrete solutions to all problems. Exactly. <laughs> conversation will happen on a timeline. <laughs> Does anyone have a question that's sitting Oh, yeah, that's great. What, what, maybe we end with questions rather than declarative mm -hmm. sentences. I'm, I'm interested in how this conversation can continue, where it's continuing, and how we can work together to uh, nurture its ongoing presence. Mm -hmm. Question mark. <laughs> Mary Catherine is just looking Bobbin. at her screen. She's bobbing. She's ready to run away. With her Trying to bait Maddie. Oh, you want me to have a question? I have a lot of questions. Oh, wow. Well, no, honestly, my question right now, which is a, is a tricky one, and um, it's always countered with Mary Catherine telling me to move to, to her traditional lands. But move I, to, I move to my traditional land. I'd like to move there too, but move to Oklahoma. Oh yeah, move to Oklahoma. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but it's like here when I'm in when I'm in Connecticut, sitting on the river. There's this thing about the American theater that's um, it's interesting, which is that it like tries to prevent you from going home. Mm -hmm. And I'm just trying to. I'm 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 constantly curious about um, how I how I keep making space to, to do the work here as opposed to always being somewhere else, which I love lots of communities and dropping into communities, but I feel like in many ways that that's not, um, 
the point of the work that I do. You know. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll still see you in Arkansas next week, Mary Catherine. Thanks. Thanks for coming out here. No, that's a really good point, though. Um, I think I, I try to do a balance um, of work within my home community. and um, But I think that um, it's such a blessing to be able to take the stories we're working on to communities that may not be familiar with them. There's sort of a different question of what does it mean to bring the story back home to home, and what does it mean to bring it to people who have likely been taught this story doesn't exist. And there's a whole different set of challenges for both, and a whole two different sets of, I think, healing and progress and decolonization that can take place uh, when those stories are shared in those two different communities, multiple different communities. Yeah, I really liked that. And I, uh, we talked about it in our um, contribution, but how can, I really, I'm also really curious about how the story changes depending on who we're speaking to, because I see that modeled in our storytellers. Like, they're not telling me the same story that they're telling to my mother or that they would tell to my little cousin, right? Or that they would tell to a visitor to the reservation. And so, um, you know, I think audience is something that we should consider because I think there's some, there's like a fetish towards fidelity, you know, getting the words exactly right every single time. Um, and in that we lose um, maybe the localness of it or the flexibility of it because the big piece I've been working on for the last two years is the indigenous core of discovery where I go into museum spaces. Um, the first one was the Smithsonian's presidential portrait gallery um, and tell this, tell people the stories that I see when I look at, for example, the life-size portrait of Andrew Jackson sitting in um, the most visited museum, one of the most visited museums in D.C. But I'm not going to take that, that performance to my tribe's museum um, because they know these stories already, and to, that's not who I'm trying to critique. So I think that they're, um, I think it's definitely something worth thinking about more. Right. We 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 gonna end on those state those question statements. Thank you. And a lot of gratitude. Yeah, let's end on gratitude. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yes. Thank you so much. This has been really wonderful, and I hope that the conversation does continue in many spaces and places, and hopefully in person sooner rather than later. Uh, thank you both for putting this together and allowing us to hold digital space with one another. Yes, <laughs> totally. Oh my God, and a big thanks to HowlRound. HowlRound, for yes. yes. Totally. And also, I mean, big thanks and affirmation for just this week and what an incredible experience it's been. Just yes. to be able to, to read, learn, connect, build. So thank you, everyone involved. Yay. Thank you. I will. Bye, folks. Bye. Well done.